Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2007 to 2008 series X-Men: Messiah Complex. Messiah Complex is the first of three multi-title crossover series featuring the X-Men from the Marvel Universe that will continue in Messiah War and end with Second Coming. The series spans across all the X titles that were running at the time. X-Factor, Uncanny X-Men, New X-Men, and X-Men with no adjective. Each creative team normally working on each title continues to contribute their part of the story. For those of you that aren't that familiar with the comic world, this kind of storytelling is pretty regular. Normally a lot of people tend to see these crossover stories as a bad thing, because the different creative teams telling a single story tends to create a lot of mixed wires and presentations that can confuse things more than necessary. There is also often a lot of jumping around in quality between the various writers and artists in such a story. I will say that, in my opinion, Messiah Complex is actually one of the most coherent and well-flowing examples of this brand of storytelling that I've ever seen, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's great, but I do feel that means it's not bad. This story comes on the heels of some previous big Marvel events that affected the X-Men and other mutants, particularly House of M and its follow-up, Decimation. You don't really need to know the specifics of those stories to be able to read this comic though, but some familiarity with some of the better known X-Men and their villains would definitely help. In fact, the primary weakness of this series might be just how out of the loop it will leave you if you're unfamiliar with the X-Men universe in general, and the current state of it specifically. Much like how Blackest Night made me feel like I needed a PhD in DC Comics history, Messiah Complex leaves even a longtime X fan like me feeling a little confused about the details. So if you're not already a big X-Men fanatic, especially if you're not already familiar with the state of affairs of the mid-2000s X-Men, then this is not the comic to be jumping on with. That said, if you are well enough acquainted with the X-Men universe, then the main thing you need to know is this. Following the House of M event, most mutants in the world lost their powers. Mutants are now basically an endangered species with only a few hundred remaining. Also, this comic came out after the movies and you can tell because Cerebro's design has been changed to be more like what they have in the movies. Also, Cerebro is now called Cerebra because it's now a she I guess because um, I don't know. Hashtag feminism? Xavier's appearance is also changed to look even more like Patrick Stewart than before if that's possible. Anyway, most striking about the decrease in mutant numbers is the fact that no new mutant has been born since M-Day, the name given to the end of the House of M story that depowered so many mutants. That is, no mutant until now. So let's see what havoc this new mutant birth creates and take this away. The series kicks off with the X-Men Messiah Complex one-shot, where the first new mutant's birth since M-Day sends out a psychic shockwave so powerful that it stuns the X-Men psychics and blows out the power in the school. The X-Men put together a team and head out to investigate the source of this shockwave. They find a town in shambles, slowly burning down with its population devastated. Turns out the X-Men were already beaten here by two groups. First, a group of mutants who work for longtime X-Villain Mr. Sinister called the Marauders. The second is a group of mutant-hating zealots named the Purifiers, who believe it is their religious duty to kill all mutants. Their mutant-hating code is so strong that they have no qualms about killing all the children of the town, even the newborn babies in the hospital, just in case one of them turns out to be a mutant. It's a horrific and gruesome scene, but it loses a bit of the tension when Emma Frost looks like she's posing for a picture on porn Twitter while looking at the dead babies. There's actually a lot of that kind of thing throughout this comic. In particular, there's a lot of men standing around having important conversations, while women do nothing but stand in the foreground or background in sexy poses. I mean, who stands like that? And why are all the women apparently required to wear uniforms with bare midriffs? It's mostly distracting because it doesn't really make any sense. For the most part though, I do find the art to be pretty good. The colors tend toward being a bit muted, but that was kind of a style for mid 2000s comics in general. I have to compliment the colorist and inkers working on this though because they managed to take the art from a very wide range of artists working on this project and work them down until they all have a fairly similar look. That would probably not be a compliment on the titles running individually, but when you're jumping from one different title to another as part of a single story, it's nice not having to completely readjust your brain to a new art style each time. 
especially not having to figure out who each character is when they drastically change appearance under a new artist. The creative team that definitely stands out the most is on New X-Men, with artist Umberto Ramos. His art strays into the children's cartoon territory, sometimes to its detriment. The characters all have long, thin, elastic proportions, and the coloring is bright and colorful, which can be a rather glaring contrast to the dark, brooding look of the other titles. Just look how he draws Layla Miller and Jamie Madrox, as compared to, well, any of the other artists on this story. The last time I read an Umberto Ramos comic, though, was X Nation 2099, which I read probably 20 years ago now. That comic, also about a teenage group of mutants recruited to be X-Men and about the search for a mutant messiah, was actually pretty similar in a lot of ways to new X-Men, so you better believe reading these issues actually hits my nostalgia right in the feels. While this does make me an ardent defender of Ramos, his art does tend to lean toward being the weakest here, especially in the big fights where I have a lot of trouble telling what on earth is supposed to be happening, or with big group scenes such as this one. What is even happening here? I I'm not really sure. My eyes just kind of glaze over while looking at it. Also, I can't help but feel that something went really wrong when drawing the green lady in the corner. I mean, seriously, what happened there? Who is that, anyway? Oh, she seems to get eaten just a couple of pages later. Well, I guess it's not important then. At least the cartoony style is rather fitting on this title, though, given that its writers are Craig Kyle and Chris Yost, the guys responsible for animated series X-Men Evolution and Wolverine and the X-Men, as well as being the creators of X-23, who, yeah, you better believe is here and kicking some serious ass. One thing I like about this series is that while every issue ties into the main story, each individual title tends to have a focus on the characters from its title. So New X-Men focuses on the young teenage mutants at Xavier's school, particularly their past with the purifiers and a mutant-eating monster that appears throughout the series named Predator X. This group has been affected perhaps the most by the recent big Marvel events. While most major X-Men characters kept their powers, leaving most of the normal groups intact, a great many of the younger X-Men lost their powers, and were murdered by the purifiers who still hated them despite them no longer being mutants. Which leads the young X-students to sneak out of school and attack the purifiers in hopes of getting some revenge. This pretty much just leads to one of their number nearly getting killed, and so they're left behind toward the end of the series, leaving them as easy prey for the giant Predator X thing when it shows up to attack them. They also suffer some serious casualties during this story, and their comic series is actually ended by the events of Messiah Complex. The comic that stands out the most to me, though, is the X-Factor comic. All the other titles here are based around specific teams of X-Men working out of the Xavier School and towards the same goals. But X-Factor was, at the time, an independent private investigation office, headed by multiple man Jamie Madrox. That just so happens to include several members of the previous version of X-Factor, probably because those are the only people Jamie knows. Its inclusion here feels pretty forced and is mostly focused on a side story. After M-Day, all possible futures involving mutants seem to vanish. But after this new mutant birth, two distinct timelines were created. So with the help of Forge, Jamie Madrox sends two of his dupes, which is short for duplicates, he's called multiple man for a reason, into the future to learn what consequences the events of this story will have. Layla Miller, a major character in the X-Factor comic at the time, whose mutant power seems to be to know things, hitches a ride with one of the dupes into the future. Unfortunately, this is a one-way trip. By dying, Jamie's dupe is able to send his intel back into the past to the original Jamie, but Layla is stuck in the future. I was reading X-Factor when this event originally happened, and by the point I had stopped reading, probably a year or so after this event, Layla had yet to return from the future. The remaining two titles, Uncanny and Adjectiveless X-Men, I have trouble telling apart. They do most of the actual plot development, though, after the events in the opening one-shot, the X-Men pursue the Marauders and the Purifiers, believing one of them to have the mutant baby. However, they don't, as it's soon revealed we have a fourth play- Oh, wait. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. A seventh- Wait, no, uh, is Forge an independent player in this? I mean, kind of. An 8, no, no, there's also the giant Predator X thing. Oh, and Lady Deathstrike is working with the Purifiers for some reason. A tenth player in this mad mix-up. Cable! Cable is supposed to be dead at this point, having died during the first story arc of the Cable Deadpool comic several years before. But no comic death is very permanent, so he's back now. Which is great, because it leads to one of my favorite images in all of comic history. Cable with a papoose. 
Yeah, real men carry babies. Growing up, Cable was always used as this depiction of super masculinity. He's giant, muscular, and carries big guns that make big explosions. Heck, he even has a robot arm with special karate chop action. Okay, maybe the karate chop action thing was just the action figure I had when I was a kid. Still, contrasting that image of the character with this guy in a baby sling? It's just too funny to me. Cable's goal is to get the baby away from all the factions and take her into a future where she can grow up without outside factors preying on her, allowing her to make her own decisions in life. But he decides not to tell the X-Men about this, certain apparently that they wouldn't trust him anyway, and with all the players in the mix and the fate of humanity, er, sorry, mutanity? Hanging in the balance, Cyclops decides to bring back the X-Team that believes in killing, and so has Wolverine create a new X-Force. Man, I wish my name appeared whenever I entered a room. X-Force will go on to get their own series following Complex, though it will change out other characters for Hepzibah and Caliban back there, partly because Caliban gets killed during this story. X-Force never manages to catch up with Cable before he reaches his destination. Forge is eerie, but someone else does. Fellow future mutant and X-Man, Bishop. What Layla and Madrox learn in the one future timeline they show us is that Bishop grew up in a mutant concentration camp, living on stories of the supposed mutant messiah. But instead of the messiah bringing life for all of mutant kind, she doomed it to the horrible fate of the concentration camps due to some unidentified major disaster that made humans hate mutants even more. So Bishop hopes to prevent that future by stopping Cable and killing the baby, before it can ever grow up to cause his future. Even he finds it difficult to kill a baby though, and the Marauders show up to stop him and claim the baby for themselves. But the Marauders have their own traitor in their midst. At some point before this story, Rogue had fallen into a coma while infected with a virus called Strain 88. Mr. Sinister was supposed to be working to cure her, but Mystique grew impatient with his work, and with Rogue, her adopted daughter, near death, she presses Sinister's face into Rogue's, so that Rogue steals his powers and he gets infected by the deadly virus. So when Gambit brings Mr. Sinister the baby, it turns out to actually be Mystique in disguise. She then, on a guess based on prophecies of her former implied lover Destiny, presses the baby to Rogue's face as well. Surprisingly, this doesn't have the same effect. Instead, it cures Rogue of her coma and the virus, but she doesn't thank Mama for the cure. Instead, she condemns her for risking the life of an innocent child, taking some of Mystique's power and memories before leaving to be by herself. Outside, the X-Men have finally all caught up, with each team mixing up to face new opponents from what they'd faced earlier in the series, and this proves effective enough. The fighting is over, but the losses are substantial. Some have been grievously injured or killed, and even their home has been completely destroyed. This happened when Bishop unleashed the nanovirus on the Sentinels that were supposed to be guarding the mansion, turning them back into the mutant killing machines that they were originally designed to be. Even here at the end, when all seems safe, and the X-Men decide to let Cable follow through on his plan of taking the baby safely into the future, they still get one last tragedy. As Cable teleports into the future, Bishop shows up firing at him. The bullets pass harmlessly through his afterimage and proceed to instead cut down Professor Xavier. With the founder of the X-Men dead, Cyclops declares the X-Men to be finished. Something tells me he'll get better though, especially since for some inexplicable reason he simply vanishes from the final panel as the shot pulls away. No one's gonna say anything about that? N nothing? Okay then, I won't either. Instead, let's get to the breakdown. I think it's a little weird how they chose to make such a huge portion of this story be just the X-Men floundering about trying to figure out what everybody else in their little universe seems to already know. Despite that, the story doesn't really feel like it's dragging. It moves along at a pretty strong pace and keeps things interesting by throwing in a number of unexpected curveballs. The art is all pretty nice too. There's little here that strikes me as particularly stylistic or memorable, but I can, if nothing else, appreciate the consistency between the titles. While the story might be a little hard to follow if you aren't a diehard X-Men fan, Messiah Complex is a pretty competent and interesting story within the X-Men universe. It's one of those major defining moments of their history with some serious long-lasting effects. So that's why I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Hi. While it's not a good starting point, if you're reading through major X-Men stories, then I'd say this should definitely be one of them. Also, for Christmas, I'm adding a new segment! 
I'm going to give a bit of a review of the trade collections of each story, each video. Because really, that's why I started these reviews to begin with, so I don't know why I haven't been including it. So to kick this off, I'm giving Messiah Complex one cable brand papoose. It's actually an excellent collection, with all stories in order and all issue covers in place, with tons of alternate covers, some information pages, and an awesome little bit at the end where they give you the original story breakdown slash plot outline that all the creative teams developed in order to tell the story. Thanks everybody for watching! Let me know what you think of the new segment as I hopefully am able to continue doing it every update. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe! Hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday season and I hope to see you next time, right here in the Comic Cave.